Здравейте на всички. Изчаквахме няколко минути за да се присъединят. Hello everyone. Участниците. We were waiting for a couple of minutes in order to see the participants join. Now we have about 30 participants. Good evening. We are starting our third webinar, which is on the topic of transport infrastructure the role of the European financial institutions and funds for sustainable and connected transport. This is a part of a series of webinars, part of our joint project together with uh, other partners, Citizens Observatory for Green Deal, Financing, and in this project we also have other European partners participating. The idea is to activate uh, the citizen society so that it is aware of the European Green Deal. And now we're focusing on the topic of the transport infrastructure. We have with us experts and colleagues from international organizations You can see them on the screen. We will focus on three main topics. These will be the transport network in Europe during the past 25 years. There will be a presentation of results of a survey by Savia So from Transport and Environment. European funding challenges and future scenarios. Excuse me, the first presentation will be from Lorelai Limousin. She's from Greenpeace Europe. And Xavier will present the European funding challenges and future scenarios. And Daniel Popov from Brands of the Earth Bulgaria and CE Bank Watch Network will focus on the case of Bulgaria. Any conflicts, any cases of uh, conflict of the transport network with the uh, Natura 2000. These are our speakers, some technical information for a start. This webinar will be held in Bulgarian and English. You can choose the language to listen into from the globe button at the bottom of your screen both in English and Bulgarian, and you can switch between languages using the little globus um, down. Uh, the webinar will be recorded, um, and later you could have access to it. Uh, you will receive a link from us. Um, so to... I would like to say that uh, there is a Q&A button for questions and answers. You can use it for posing your questions, and we're going to answer them. I'd like to say I'm sorry, but uh, I will speak in English. My name is Desislava Stojanova, and I'm from Zazemiata, or Friends of the Youth Bulgaria, together with Eva Dimitrova. We are moderating this series of uh, webinars. We are part of the Economic Fairness uh, team together with Mr. Popov. And I would like to give the floor now to Xavier Sol, Director of Sustainable Finance in Transport and Environment. Xavier, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well and that you can see my screen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, what I will do is to provide a brief overview of the main 
instruments at European level that are financing a transport infrastructure. Um, I'm working for Transport and Environment, which is a European federation of NGOs, most of them specialized in transport issues. Um, and we actually advocate for a zero emissions mobility system that is affordable, minimizes environmental, climate and health impacts, also that maximizes the efficiency of resources and guarantees the safety and sufficient access to all. So as part of this work, I'm looking more specifically into investments, public and private investments for the decarbonization and the transformation of the transport sector. First of all, why does transport matter? I mean, it's obvious that there there is a very strong social dimension attached to mobility issues at large. And then, as we will see later in the webinar also, transport infrastructure can have very important uh, and severe uh, impacts on the nature and the environment. And just from a climate perspective, this is the graph you have here. You will see that if the EU reaches its objectives, uh, its climate objectives on 2050 horizon, in 2030, that's on the, the, the right uh, column, you will see that the transport emissions will represent 45% of European uh, CO2 emissions. So it's a massive part of our emissions in Europe. Uh, looking at the investments for transport, I will focus mostly on the EU budget, so the so-called multi-annual financial framework, and then still looking at some instruments outside of the EU budget. Um, the recovery and resilience facility, also the role of public banks, especially the European Investment Bank. And then I also wanted to mention that there are still many other smaller instruments and initiatives existing at European level, but I won't go in details into them. Um, so you have, for example, funds that are generated through the carbon markets at, at uh, European level that then are uh, supporting transport projects as well. So starting from the EU budget, uh, I mean, it's a massive, uh, actually, um, pot of money that we have at European level, more than a trillion and a half euros out of a period of seven years. So the current budget is running from 2021 to 2027. And uh, in 2023, it should be around 200 billion euros that are being disbursed across Europe. Not only for transport, of course, but transport is a significant part. Uh, that money is mostly coming from contributions of European governments, so actually taxpayers' money. And then in terms of how it is being spent, uh, actually a quarter of it is directly distributed by the European Commission and different agencies at EU level, but still three quarters of that budget comes back at the national level to public authorities, governmental, regional, or um, local authorities for them to spend this budget. Um, what are the key elements of the, of the EU budget for transport? The first one I'd like to mention are the cohesion and regional funds. So a very important uh, part of the EU budget, especially for, for countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the European Regional Development Fund, for example, is 226 billion um, euro for this uh, EU budget period. Cohesion funds a bit more than 40 billion euros. And what it mostly does is to provide grants, so cash to support projects. Traditionally, rather small and middle-sized projects, but still there are also bigger, bigger projects that are being financed. And this is, for example, a tool for uh, municipalities to finance um, their, their, transport, their transport system. Um, there is also some budget going for research and development and innovation um, for transport, and that's the, the Horizon Europe program, which has a specific uh, pot dedicated to, uh, to transport. But I think the most important thing when thinking about transport infrastructure is the so-called Trans-European Networks for Transport, TNT. And there is a specific financing instrument linked to that, which is the Connecting Europe Facility for Transport. Uh, the so-called TNT is 
basically a tool that was developed to um, actually to accelerate the development of transport infrastructure across the EU. So within that, you have nine major corridors. You will see a map here um, showing you how they look like. And under those corridors, you have almost everything from railways to inland waterways, uh, maritime and inland ports, airports and terminals. Um, so basically the idea is to achieve uh, a network of infrastructure across Europe. And you have different layers in this network that constitute these nine, these nine corridors. Um, the Connecting Europe facility, um, that is the, the instrument that is supposed to co-finance some of these projects, which are considered as of European uh, common interest, you see the type of projects they finance here. You have road, road projects, so motorways, bridges, you have airports, um, you have tramways, metro lines, uh, in terms of urban transport. For this uh, budgetary period at EU level, it's around 25 billion euros um, that the EU is disbursing uh, to co-finance this type of projects. When looking into um, you know, how this Connecting Europe facility is portrayed, it's more and more used for rail uh, projects, as you would see on the, on the left side of the, of the graph. So the focus on sustainability is supposed to be important. Then looking at the reality of these large infrastructure projects that are being financed, there are also some, let's say, uh, a less rosy picture that can be described in some of the projects. So I put there also a picture of one of the emblematic projects that is facing strong opposition uh, in France and Italy, which is this Lyon Turin rail. So uh, when you look at different, um, you know, uh, budget tool at European level, it's more than 1 billion euros that is being committed to this specific project, despite um, very strong local opposition. Looking outside of the European budget, I will mention a few extremely important instruments as well. The first one is Next Generation EU. So you may have heard about it. Uh, its main instrument is the Recovery and Resilience Facility. And that was the key tool uh, put together by the European Union to fight uh, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the, the European Union decided to uh, emit debt collectively and channel that money to governments across Europe through the national recovery and resilience plans that all member states have to design. Um, here we are speaking mostly about grants, so once more cash that is going to projects, but also governments um, re are receiving some loans from the European Union. And here, uh, part of this is supposed to go to climate-friendly projects, 37% of the total amount. Um, but clearly, climate hasn't been at the heart of that, of that instrument. It was still, you know, really to, to uh, try to get the economy rolling after uh, after the pandemic hit. One of the lessons learned um, along the recent years, and I think it has been well documented by many colleagues of NGOs, was around the lack of transparency and public participation uh, around the, the recovery and resilience facility. So you can go online, use this online dashboard. I took a screenshot and put it there to try to see what are the projects being financed. But still, you don't get really the full picture and public participation in designing this, uh, these national plans has been very scarce uh, and limited. Um, so actually, it's pretty hard to get all the data about how the uh, how this this money is used, but you will see here from uh, the blue part of the column so for sustainable mobility that looking at the entire EU, it's around thirty percent of the recovery and resilience facility that went for transport, so sustainability, sustainable mobility here, so almost a third of it. So it's a significant sector for for public investments across Europe. Um, yes, the European Investment Bank, I wanted to, to mention that institution because 
traditionally the EU budget has rather been grants going to projects and then in parallel, let's say the European Investment Bank, which is uh, the bank of the European Union, was providing other types of financial instruments to transport infrastructure projects. Traditionally loans, but also equity, sometimes, sometimes guarantees as well. So the European Investment Bank is a major public investor in the transport field, traditionally for large-scale infrastructure. Um, in average, it's around more 10 billion euros a year of new investments in the transport sector. And when you look at the full stock of loans of, of the bank, 25% of it is linked to operations in the transport sector. Um, I will show you the analysis from, from uh, colleagues at the NGO Counterbalance that looked into the, uh, the past investments of the European Investment Bank in the transport sector. I would say that there is a progressive greening of its portfolio, but still issues remain with carbon heavy assets, and that's quite visible in the in the transport sector. So these are figures from 2020 and 2021. So 21 billion euros of operations of the EIB in the transport sector. Uh, in a nutshell, out of it, 75% um, is going for rail. Uh, infrastructure and uh, and urban transport so which is positive compared to, to, to previous trends still there is a portion of the lending that goes uh, uh, to motorways for example 2.9 uh, billion euros out of two years over small road investments airport infrastructure expansion um, and the expansion of sea ports as well so in total it's still around 20 percent of these investments that can be considered as non-aligned with the Paris Agreement on climate. And I will now just make a connection uh, through other ways in which the EU is influencing transport investments at national level. First thing I quickly wanted to mention is so-called fiscal rules. So these are all the rules set at European level for how governments can finance uh, their economy, including their green transition. So it's the famous 3% uh, public deficit rule on a year, etc. cetera. Um, I just wanted to mention that there, there was a very interesting uh, report from colleagues at New Economics Foundation showing that under the current rules, under the current EU fiscal framework, only nine member states would be able to achieve the EU climate targets. The others actually are not allowed to invest enough in their own economy. So beyond the investments that come from the EU, you also have this set of rules that have an impact on transport investments. The second one I wanted to refer to is state aid. So here, these are the rules that define how governments can subsidize their industry and can directly, let's say, provide a credit uh, break to one specific company. Here, um, it's important to mention because uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic um, and also the, the Russian invasion on, on Ukraine, there's been a change of these rules, which now make it easier for governments to finance sustainable mobility, for example, or clean technologies at national level. Still, the problem is that actually there are not <laughs> a lot of countries with deep pockets to actually finance their transitions through this way. So if you look at the statistics uh, over the last years, Germany and France together, they represent 75% of all, you know, the, the financing of these rules at European level. So this is really about financing, let's say, national champions and that is clearly creating an unbalance at European level because there are some governments that don't really have the financial means to do the same um, than what the Germans are doing. And actually, a lot of it uh, is going to, to transport uh, as well with, again, limited limited transparency. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we should not forget that still most of the financing for transport takes place at national level. Uh, and actually, this is where the bulk of harmful subsidies are. And on that graph, you will see it's coming from a, a European Commission's report that was published two weeks ago. It maps all the fossil fuel subsidies in the EU uh, that have been awarded over the last years. And if you look at the right side, 2022, you will see that what is 
in yellow, the yellow category is for transport. And that was 34 billion euros that went to support to the oil industry uh, following the, uh, the war in Ukraine. So it's actually a lot of these subsidies are linked to transport, to the transport sector. And also when you look at national subsidies, some can be considered as being more positive. And I just wanted to provide one example. We have colleagues that looked into uh, subsidies to support the purchase of electric vehicles across Europe. And in 2022, you, you can see that it's 5.9 billion euros that were spent this year, this way in Europe. Then again, looking at the geographical concentration, you see the challenge. More than half of it was in Germany, quarter of it in France, and much less in, in other European countries. Um, yeah, I will stop here because I already run over time. Uh, these are a few thoughts for the discussion later, but clearly challenges in terms of public participation, transparency, the safeguards uh, linked to, to, to infrastructure pro projects across Europe when they get EU public funding. So I'm more than happy to get back to that and, and have a discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier. Um, it's been really interesting. And we will have we will have the opportunity to to have questions from everyone, from all the participants after all the speakers um, finish their presentations. But feel free to type up your questions if you have them now. We already had one, Xavier, and that could be for later, or if you could share in the chat a link to the EU map um, that you showed in the beginning of your presentation. Um, it's really interesting to see all the all the different finance mechanisms uh, and the weight of, of all of them. So we will come back to the future um, according to you, but now we I'll pass the word to Lorelai Limousin from um, uh, Greenpeace European Unit. She's the um, energy and climate campaigner and she will present uh, among other things, the very interesting latest report that Greenpeace uh, commissioned um, and will give us a bit of a overview of um, what was what how the transport network uh, in Europe has been developing. Where where I to you? <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone. Good, good evening. Um, Thank you for having me uh, in this webinar. It's really interesting. Um, so I work as a campaigner on, yes, climate, a bit of energy and transport with the EU office of Greenpeace. So I'm based in Brussels in Belgium, but I'm originally French, as you can hear maybe. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and yeah, I don't remember yes. how to hide this. No. We can see it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, so Greenpeace, um, we have a campaign called Mobility for All, which is really aiming at transforming the transport system so it's more fair, more just but also more sustainable but so it's not just about decarbonization it's about making sure that we use our energy our investments our infrastructure in a way that really meet people's needs in Europe and uh, of course that doesn't uh, contribute to the climate crisis um, so this mobility for all campaign is driven by several offices across Europe so I work with colleagues uh, in Austria, in Belgium, in Germany, in Italy, and so on. And uh, together in, sep in September, we released this report about the funding and the development of the transport infrastructure in Europe. And next, how does this work? Sorry. Yeah. So maybe a couple of words about this report. Um, 
it was commissioned by Greenpeace CAE to two institutes, the Wuppertal Institute and the T3 Transportation Think Tank. And we looked at two things mainly, but yeah, actually more things. You, you can have a look at the report later. But the two main things were first, the investments made by the 28 EU countries plus Norway, Switzerland and the UK in roads, so all roads and all rail infrastructures since 1995. And the authors, the researchers also looked at the development of the motorway, so not all roads, but motorways, and the rail infrastructure in the same countries since 1995. Uh, we started in 1995 because that's where, when we started to have information for all countries. Um, in the official data sets like EU, Eurostat, and so on. Uh, so I've put links to our press release, the original report from the authors, and our own Greenpeace report or fact sheet, which is actually more than 30 pages long. So you can find information about each country. Uh, this is a slide about the methodology. I'm not going to go through this, but uh, you have it on hand. If you have question about where we found the data, what did we look at in part, like more in details, uh, I, I think you will get the slides later. Um, so main findings. Um, we've found out that since 1995, Europe, so these 27 countries plus UK, Norway, and Switzerland, we lost 15,000 kilometers of rail. Um, so that's really about the length of the network. And we lost 2,600 passenger train stations in Europe. So train stations that were closed since 1995. Uh, as the one on the picture, which is on Austria, in Austria, sorry, it's uh, it's a train station that was closed to passenger transport. Um, and in the meantime, in parallel, uh, European countries have built 30,000 kilometers of motorways. So, as you may know, since 1990, the transport sector has been really a driver of climate, of greenhouse gases emissions in Europe. So it's been a driver, a main driver of the climate crisis. And it's even a sector that has increased um, its emissions um, while all the sectors have decreased their emissions since 1990. And in 1990, of course, we already knew about climate change. We already had negotiations at international level on how to fight against the climate crisis. So, yeah, this, is, this has been a, a development, an evolution, a trend that was really uh, in contradiction with what we knew already about the effect of oil on climate. So a bit more figures on a European level. Um, so yeah, the length of motorways uh, has grown by 60% from 50,000 to 82,000, which is huge, uh, with the biggest rates in Ireland, Romania, and Poland, and the lowest rates in Lithuania, Latvia, and Belgium. And some, in some countries, it's more than doubled, like Spain, Norway, and Greece. In parallel, the European railway network length decreased by 6%, 6 percent, 6.5 percent. So that's the whole railway network. And if we look just at the um, passenger uh, rail, it's 13,700 kilometers of regional passenger lines, which were closed since 1995. In some countries like France or Germany, the European railway network decreased by even more than 10%. And yeah, on a more positive note, we found out that more than half of the kilometers of 
regional passenger rail where that were closed could be reopened relatively easily because the infrastructure is still there or there's nothing new on on the on the ground that was built after the closure of the rail line. So we see a lot of potential for lines to be reopened. And yes, as I mentioned, almost 2,600 train stations have been closed to, to passenger rail, and this has disproportionately affected um, people living in rural or non-urban areas, at least. It's a bit slow when I'm switch going to the next slide. Sorry about this. Okay, so this is about the investments. This is the second thing we looked at. It's a comparison of road investments in red and green, uh, rail investment in green. And uh, as you can see, both increased since 1995, but there has been 66% more investment in roads than in rail. So 1.5 trillion euros invested on road, whereas we had 930 billion on rail. Recently, you can see that the gap has narrowed a bit, but it's still quite crazy because many European countries have continued to close more railway lines and stations and build more motorways, even in countries which are very well served, like France or Germany. Uh, so this can give you a um, snapshot of the comparison country per country. It's in French, sorry, but it's one of the newspapers, Les Echos, which is a financial newspaper in France, who did this uh, infographic. And you can see the countries which invest yeah, the most in roads compared to rail. And you can see that Belgium, United Kingdom and Austria are the only three European in countries which invested more in rail than in road. <clears throat> and that's the spending per inhabitant. So that's also a fair, yeah, that's a fair picture. <clears throat> so then that's where we found the biggest gaps in investment, meaning where the countries invest in much more in road uh, and, uh, than for like rail. And you can see that it's going up to 12 times more investment uh, in roads than on rail in Romania, seven times in Croatia, 6.5 times in Poland, six times in Ireland. So yeah, and um, that's not only, it's a lot of countries from the central Eastern Europe, but not only, like you also have Ireland, Norway, Greece, Portugal, Um, and that's the countries where most railway lines were closed, lines for passenger transport. And the first one is Germany. Um, then you have Poland, Italy, Spain, Hungary, Austria, Latvia, Portugal, Greece, Estonia. So that's the absolute numbers. So of course, it also depends on the size of the country. But you can see that, for example, Hungary is on the top five, whereas it's not a big country or such a big country. <clears throat> Austria as well. Uh, whereas, yeah, we usually know Austria as a good example for rail. So, yeah, that's really that was really interesting findings that we we had. Um, and you can see the comparison um, in relative terms in the report. So I chose a few countries to focus on, <clears throat> just hearing like where some of you are from. If I start with Bulgaria, we found out that the that yeah Bulgaria invested around nine point six billion in roads and only two point four billion in railways, so four times as much investment in roads as than in rail. And yeah, as a consequence, the motorway network has grown by 
while the total railway network has reduced by 6%. And 13 regional railway lines have been closed to passenger transport. So again, this has cut off thousands of people from access to railways. And unfortunately, in Bulgaria, we didn't find out that these lines could be easily reopened. Uh, it needs major investments. So that's lost. Uh, then in Italy, um, we found out that Italy is, has invested 28% more in roads than in railways since 1995. Um, the motorway network has grown by 8%, and this is the fourth lowest growth rate. So that can give you a, an idea. <clears throat> and more than the than seventy five percent of the high speed railway network in Italy was built after nineteen ninety five, and he's actually quite big now. It's uh, around nine hundred twenty one kilometers. But what we've seen is that this expansion has gone hand in hand with the destruction of a more like regional rail network. So total length of thousand eight hundred kilometers have been closed to passenger transport. Sorry. But uh, on a more positive side, we've seen that in Italy, more than 90% of the lines have not been dismantled yet and could be reopened. So there's a lot of potential as well as to open new or yeah, old new railway stations that were closed and that could be open again. In Poland, uh, the investment has been six times higher uh, in roads than in as in railways. So this is the third worst ratio of all the countries analyzed behind Romania and Croatia. And the Polish motorway network has grown by 1,466 kilometers, so 600% almost. So this is the third highest relative growth rate behind Ireland and Romania. And in parallel, the total railway network has shrunk by 19%, which in absolute terms is also really big, 4,660 kilometers. And yeah, compared to other countries in CE, Poland is the only country with, uh, which has a high-speed rail network with 224 kilometers. <clears throat> so I thought this was also interesting to note. So yeah, as I said in the beginning, our campaign now is very much focused on giving access to most people, to everyone, to sustainable mobility, and starting with a, a strong, dense public transport network. Um, and uh, what we've seen is that a lot of people outside the cities have had no option but to own a car. To, so to get to their activities, or to not move, which is also the case of many people in Europe. And this is really the result of the dismantling of the infrastructure, but also of the subsidies that have been much more directed to road than to rail. And I think yeah, I finished my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, for this overview and the picture that fortunately we see that motorways have by large prevailed in the past years uh, over railway. This is also a good uh, bridge to pass the word to our colleague um, Daniel Popov who will focus a bit more on uh, who, he will zoom in into Bulgaria and he would focus on the funds that have been going to develop the transport, the transport network infrastructure in Bulgaria. He's also on the monitoring committee of the operational program transport. Um, and he would say also what would be, what are the conflicts um, that some of those transport corridors are posing. Daniel, would you like me to share the presentation? I will do. Um... Hello, everyone. 
Улучшаване на демографското състояние в районите. При нас, освен ограничаването на самия жертва транспорт, много често е ограничен достъп до самите гари, дори когато. Извинявай, че те прекъсвам. Малко не се чува много добре. Може ли пак да пробваш? Да. Прекъсва връзката. Имахме тести, то беше окей, но сега нещо не се чува. Сега по-добре? Да. А, добре. Ако не се чува, исках само да добавя, че съществуващи Тук имаме коментар, че са се смесили двата канала, превод и оригинален език. Uh, Даниел говори на български. Може ли да пробваш? Не е много добре. Не знам без слушалки дали не е добре. Или... Извиняваме се на всички. За малко търпение. Молим. Да, не се чува. Извинявам се. На всички мога да предложа на Даниел да дойде при мен, тъй като сме в един офис. И да му предоставя слушалките. Тогава се чува. Кажете нещо. По-добре ли е така? Да, много по-добре. Okay, super. Добре, да се надяваме, че, че така ще продължи. Let's hope that uh, it will continue in a good way from now on. Let me note uh, in the beginning, in the context of uh, the presentation of my colleague Lorelai, very often in Bulgaria, even if we have regional road, railroad networks, uh, we lack complementary transport, which uh, makes the situation worse. And the lack of this complementary transport is uh, contributing to a worsening demographic situation. Why did I decide to focus my presentation on operational program transport in Bulgaria? The first reason is that uh, this is the program which uh, is responsible for the implementation of uh, the transport corridors in Bulgaria. And secondly, because I know this program very well, I would like us to focus on the specific case in order to see the mechanism of the problems uh, leading to where we are now funding more uh, road transport and uh, worsening railway lines and being far from a sustainable transport system, which is the main goal of the European transport policy.
Can you see my presentation? The general picture of the financial instruments used in Bulgaria is as follows. We use the Cohesion and Regional Development Funds. Xavier mentioned this. What is specific about these funds is that these investments are strictly oriented towards the implementation of the European transport policies. At the national level, this funding is channeled through several operational programs, transport, regional program, but also the agricultural European, the cross-border cooperation programs. The infrastructure was uh, financed under the pre-accession funds and under the new tools, the RRP, and the connected Europe facility. Transport program aims um, approving the standards on the cross uh, European uh, corridors, the main ones and extended network, and uh, to make sure that uh, we have good networks with the uh, other member states. This is the largest national operational program. This is the transport program, which is with uh, exceptional priority on the political level, but also as administrative servicing. Mm, close to all beneficiaries of the program are large institutions state agencies with uh, considerable uh, budgets and uh, capabilities. Let me make a short overview of the three operational programs. The first one from 2007-2013 had a main goal, development of sustainable transport system. The specific goals were integration of the national network to the EU transport network, reaching a balance between the transport modes. A specific task under this program was to develop a national transport master plan. The budget of the program was 2 billion euro. And during the implementation of this program, we had to introduce three major challenges. The Struma motorway was the first road priority. I'm mentioning Struma motorway here because at the end, from the particular case of operational program transport, we're going to move to the even more particular case of this project for the Struma motorway in order for us to underline once again the deficits uh, in the design phase and in the implementation phase of these pro projects. And the assessment was uh, done in 2020, which did not allow to take uh, use of the lessons learned in the planning of the program 14, 2020. This program, Transport and Transport Infrastructure 14-2020 was once again with the main goal development of sustainable transport system and specific goals to increase the railway traffic of passengers and goods, removing the bottlenecks uh, along the tent T network and increasing the intermodal transport between the different modes of transport. The budget was 1.9 billion euro. This program had to see five major changes and a sixth one which occurred 
In the last months, when it turned out that one part of the money, I think about 100 million euro, will not be able to be implemented under the program, and they were reallocated under the SAFE uh, fund for um, help to do with uh, Ukraine. For the, seventh, uh, for the second seven-year period, the uh, Strum motorway was the first uh, road priority. The assessment of the 1420 program, which came in 22, said that the completed projects are two of six in the railroad sector and one of the two in the road sector. The new program, Transport uh, Connectivity 2127, does not have uh, main and specific goals. It adopted directly the EU funds regulation and its policy objectives. There are two for a greener, low-carbon economy, transitioning towards net-zero economy, and number three, through a connected Europe by enhancing mobility. The budget is once again 1.9 billion euro. However, the project for lot 3.2 of uh, Struma Highway through the Kresna Gorge is now third road priority, not first, with uh, 140 million euro allocated for it, which is uh, expected to be four times less than the estimated initial cost of the project. Please excuse my graphic skills, but this maps this map shows how the railroad projects were developed in the different uh, programs and funds. In blue, you saw what was set in the 2007-13 program. These are the Plovdiv, Svilingrad, Turkish border, and Plovdiv, Burgas. You can see that this project does not link us with uh, other EU member states. And in this sense, cannot fulfill its goals to the full. In yellow, 2014-2020, what was expected was for the railway line to reach Sofia, so Plovdiv, Sofia. And the Ministry of Transport had committed when this program was uh, adopted to apply for the Sofia Vidin uh, railway under the connecting Europe facility. Neither were completed. Well, the Sofia wasn't completed and there wasn't an application for a large uh, reconstruction of the railway line between Sofia Vidin and uh, to Romania. The new program, let me go back, however, in 1420-20, uh, uh, to replace uh, the Sofia Plodiv project, uh, there was a proposal uh, for rehabilitating the Sofia Kalotina, the Serbian borderline. And now, in the new program, these railway projects uh, are seeing an uh, even lower ambition to implement tent links. The Sofia Vidin line is no longer there. 
What has been proposed are certain paths between Sofia, Pernik, Radomir and working on the route towards Macedonia, North Macedonia, a third non-European country. Since I have participated in the working groups which uh, designed the programs, let me mention that I have always insisted on behalf of our environmental organizations to have the implementation of the links with Greeks under the international corridor to link Bulgaria, uh, the, the Thessaloniki port and Athens, and the Sofia Vidin link to Romania and then to Central Europe. The graph you can see on the, the, the table you can see on the right has been taken by the assessment uh, for operational program 2014-2020, which was completed in 22, and it gives us a very clear idea. You can see an increase between 2013 and 2029 of the railway freight transport, and there is a reduction by 6% of the passenger transport. I have been monitoring these processes, and I can say that this change is due to one factor. The extraction companies in Bulgaria and three large processing companies have uh, large quantities of mine concentrate transported from the mines to the processing companies and uh, between courts as well. This mine concentrate, due to specificity, is not a desired freight and uh, was always commented upon when it was uh, um, transported with uh, road transport. So the majority, in the majority of the cases, it is transported through railway lines lately. Another factor, as you know, there is a sharp increase in uh, burning waste in cement factories. Uh, many of them come to the ports of Burgas and Varna, and they're also transported mainly through the railway transport. However, in passenger transport, we can clearly see there is a worsening of the situation. And another major factor of the European policy for a zero death rate along roads, we can see no significant reduction in Bulgaria. And there are numerous details, much more than this. But from my viewpoint, we can make conclusions that over two operational programs, we couldn't implement their goals. The poor planning quality has made our transport system more dependent on petrol, and we can see an increase in uh, pollution from the transport system. What's interesting is in that in the assessment of operational programs, we can see that the projects implemented under the program have led to a reduction in pollution. However, when the data came out under the energy plan for Bulgaria until 2050, we can clearly see that the pollution from the transport sector is not expected to decrease significantly even after 2030. That is, as a whole, we have a worsening of the situation, and of course, we still miss adequate links with the European transport network despite the serious amounts and the 15 years under these programs. One of the factors which has an impact, in addition, is that when there is a delay under a certain project, 
The administration of the operational program and of the institutions in general make everything possible to save the funding. And in this way, many projects were replaced with others that did not meet the strategic goals of the program. For example, when the railway transport projects were delayed, many of the large part of the funding went for reconstructing railway stations. It's good for passengers, but it doesn't resolve the transport problem. Which are the obstacles and challenges that we have to overcome in order to rectify these negative trends? So far, we have seen low quality of uh, strategic planning. It seems that uh, whenever a strategic document is being drafted, there is a clash between the European transport priorities and the national transport priorities defined by the different institutions nationally. And these transport strategic documents considerably underestimate the European transport priorities. We can see a very bad trend along every uh, transport, uh, irrespective of the level, um, to always develop the uh, road transport corridor. My explanation is that if uh, we first uh, see a completion of the railway corridor, it, once it becomes very convenient for the freight and passenger transport, then we will not manage to prove uh, the necessary traffic for the economic implementation of the road transport uh, as it has been set in the beginning. A bad quality of the programming of the Europe, of the operational programs is something we can see. Their goals, indicators, and projects uh, are not subject to the strategic goals which have been claimed. Another problem, as I mentioned, is that uh, by changing these projects, once uh, the program is adopted and its financial uh, parameters are adopted, we can see changes, uh, for example, in 1420, once the program started, funds uh, allocated for implementing the Struma Highway in the Kresna Gorge will be reallocated for the Sofia Ring Road. And we have a generally negative attitude towards the goals uh, for the environment. This is uh, quite obvious uh, uh, with the environmental impact assessments on the different projects and the new principle that we follow uh, do no significant harm principle and uh, the impact on Natura 2000 uh, having protected areas. And of course, what we definitely need is a more effective dialogue between citizens and institutions, because if, let's say, the dialogue has been happening formally for many years, given what citizens want as a change in the project is uh, happens very rarely. How can we overcome all these issues? What we have to do, including uh, the Green Deal package, we need a revision and alignment with the strategic papers uh, to the EU transport priorities. Concepts such as all dependency uh, need to be introduced, and uh, we need to have need to set goals uh, to reduce them, as well as uh, need to 
implement uh, the uh, polluter pace principle. And most of you know that introducing um, toll fees was uh, one of the conditions set in 2012-2015 before uh, the operational program 2014 uh, was adopted. But as you know, the polluters uh, do, still do not pay as much as uh, the Bulgarian citizens pay through their uh, vehicle units. We need better strategy uh, for the implementation of uh, European funds uh, in, in, uh, in transport investments, strengthening the connections with uh, the EU member states, cleaner transport, and providing more efficient service to the citizens. And last but not least, of course, the third a basic factor, key factor is effective institution, institutional, uh, inter-institutional consultation and institutional consultations for the public. We need more efficient work that will allow improvement of projects before their approval. One of the reasons to see the uh, such delay on the projects uh, is that uh, the environmental impact assessments and consultations and quickly without taking into account the people's opinions and then these projects undoubtedly face difficulties in their implementation. And now the particular case in mind in uh, Struma Arm uh, Motorway, this is the Kresna Gorge case, leaving aside the road that it is uh, located in the Kresna Gorge and the fact that uh, there is uh, valuable biodiversity and nature which has been protected under several regimes. And if we just pay attention to the strategic institutional mistakes that were made to, uh, over the years uh, that led to this uh, result of having a, a motorway with a 15 kilometer section that not only causes issues but it hasn't found a solution and the solution is actually so easy and it was available in 2008 but let me uh, stress uh, those uh, first and foremost uh, the priority was placed on the road project before the railway infrastructure. If the railway was modernized in time, we would not have had transport issues as we have now. The appetite for fast consumption of the funds that were especially from uh, uh, by uh, road uh, the road agency has uh, led to the uh, building the easier parts of uh, the motorway instead of uh, focusing on the more difficult sections and then completing the easier parts without causing any transport or road issues. The new environmental impact assessment for the Crescent Gorge alone is a very uh, contradictory uh, practice. This is uh, the so-called salami approach that has been uh, rejected by the European Commission uh, uh, in uh, doing environmental assessment, impact assessment, and the whole chain starting from uh, the uh, uh, the option, the, the version of uh, the tunnel adopted in 2008 was uh, enforced by the lobby of uh, transport com uh, uh, construction companies. Uh, these companies uh, issued an opinion that uh, the version having a road through the gorge is uh, faster, cheaper, more environmentally friendly, and they urged the original development ministry to revise the project. The ministry did it. Today, the project has not uh, been uh, implemented yet, and it is also quite clear that it is uh, 
uh, neither cheaper nor more environmentally friendly. But the assessment was made uh, later when the, we asked for the money for the implementation of the project. And uh, the opinion of the European Commission was that it does not meet the environmental and biodiversity protection criteria. And despite all these discussions, throughout the years, including by institutions outside of Bulgaria, the European Commission, the Bulgarian authorities, and more particularly the Environment Ministry and Transport Ministry, still are trying to push that same project forward, closing their eyes for all those recommendations made by the public, by the, the researchers, the local community in, uh, in Kresnogorch, which has been insisting for uh, the tunnel, as well as the biodiversity uh, organization. Uh, thank you, Danielle. That was the end of the presentation. Thank you for the focus on Bulgaria, which was not that optimistic. Uh, there was one uh, clarifying question about the conclusions in the slide that you had uh, in the presentation. What were the data for the in the last column uh, for. As I said, this is just a table that has been taken from the Environment Impact Assessment 2014-2020, uh, this report and the uh, assessment are available on the uh, operational program website with all the explanations, but I think most of the data has been provided in 2019. This is the right approach because the COVID crisis has um, distorted many of uh, the data provided. Uh, generally, 2020 is a year that we should not take into account. Thank you, uh, all panelists. We have 15 more minutes uh, until the end of the webinar, uh, where you can ask your questions in the Q&A chat. We will answer your questions. I want to go back to Xavier and Lorelei. I wanted to get back to you um, for uh, on the question of how do you see the future, the future of the transport network development? How how would we make how would we really move towards sustainable connectivity? Um, having all those funds available, but seeing that unfortunately motorways have been by by far prioritized and we also have a question i think in the in the same direction by our colleague Ivan Lukhlebalov what are the mechanisms at the eu level to promote or even enforce railway development um and reduce or even eliminate funding for motorways maybe first to said yeah Sure, I can talk, and I'm sure I will, will add other ideas. Uh, I mean, as you said, that there is a lot of money available, actually, for the transport system. So the first thing is to better spend this fund. And what I mean by better spending is, first of all, not spending any more into projects, into infrastructure that just perpetuates the, the current uh, transport system. So very cautious approach to infrastructure, making sure that the growth of uh, you know transport demand stops um, no new airports no new motorways focus on the infrastructure that makes a difference for the people um, so that's the first thing and of course the the end to fossil fuel subsidies which as i showed before as a link to transport that is a major issue that still hasn't been resolved at european level as ngos we've been campaigning on that for decades now but there is still a lot of work to be done um, regarding fossil fuel subsidies. And then it's about making the best use of the resources at hand. So investing in urban transport at municipal level. Um, at TNE, we're also promoting electric mobility, but here it's extremely important to make sure that it's linked to questions of affordability and access for the people. So these are not only rich people that can afford electric cars. 
So what we are trying to do is we push governments to also put in place measures like social leasing schemes, you know, um, that also promotes a more circularity for the for the vehicles. Um, and at the end of the day, I think there, there would be the need for a toolbox of instruments, right? Um, I think there are some transport companies that don't need public subsidies. There are authorities that really need support, uh, but not all projects are bankable. So some grants, so traditional cash would be needed, but perhaps not for all the, tr the transport development in Germany or Scandinavian countries, you know? So I think that we need to be more granularity in how we decide what is really, where there is really a gap in terms of, of mobility. Um, still, you know, I mentioned there is money available, but let's keep in mind that the next budget at the European level will be discussed. Um, there would also be in 2026 the end of next generation EU, so this pandemic funds. Still, there could be at some point uh, an investment gap for transport as well. I mean, a lot of public authorities are facing barriers, you know, to invest in their transition in a clean and fair just transition. So, yeah, we need to, to think about how to create these um, extra resources for investing in climate. It can be through taxation, through better uh, doing the polluter based principle. Um, so to allow actually public authorities to really invest in people and the transition. Thank you, Xavier. Would you like to yeah, sure. your point of view? Yeah, so when we released the report in September, we really stressed the need to stop building and funding the problems like motorways and airports, of course. We made some progress at the EIB, the European Investment Bank level with Xavier a few years ago. Um, but yeah, these institutions still fund uh, motorways that are problematic. So... Um, there's still a lot of work to do, to do um, especially in the light of the next budget that uh, Xavier just mentioned, the next EU budget that is for seven years that will be discussed in the coming years for the period after 2027. Uh, <laughs> so it's not now, but it's going to be long negotiations and we need to make sure that the money is really used for a good purpose. So both access to mobility, but also sustainable mobility, which makes sure that we are still in the boundaries of our planet and our ecosystems. So, yeah, and, uh, and of course, there's a big gap in investment. First, there's a big amount of money that is going to yeah, problematic projects or fossil fuel subsidies in the transport sector. So there's all this money, this money flows that we need to redirect to the solutions. So if I mention just like the aviation tax exemptions um, that airlines are benefiting from, it's more than 30 billion euros in Europe. So that's, and um, yeah, that's the kind of measures that we need on the other side, on the tax side, to be able to invest in the solutions. Um, if I'm thinking of the EU level, we, we think we need like new pot of money to fund for especially the missing links between countries, because now the EU is very much focused on big projects, but there's also a lot of links which are smaller infrastructure, but which, which have been kind of abandoned or are degraded now for multiple reasons. And that could be like really uh, quicker, efficient links for cross-border, but not necessarily high-speed project, more like a daily commuting for people living in a border regions or, yeah, for traveling. So, yeah, a lot of, uh, yeah, changes to do in several <laughs> funds at EU level, but especially also in the national and local practice to really direct the funds towards the, the, the real solutions. Thank you. Tania, would you like to add your point of view? What could be the future? How could we move towards a more sustainable transport? Then? Uh, yeah, uh, 
Имаше също и някои от въпросите. За изпълнението на европейски We have European funds for the implementation of European policies uh, with clear priorities. On the other hand, it is a mandatory to, uh, to introduce the polluter pay principle and I believe that uh, if the whole freight transport is levied, the taxi deserves for the pollution it causes, the interest in railway transport will be very тези високи такси преди да сме осигурили альтернативата. Това беше едно от другите предложения с програмирането на 14-20-та програмата. Приоритетно да се фокусира върху няколкото пункта по границите, където да се осигури с не много пари удобно прехвърляне на контейнери и твари от автомобили на ЖП транспорт. Това, за съжаление, го нямаме годен днес. Но да се върна, всъщност, изпълнение на европейските политики е напълно достатъчно за правилния път на пет. Просто повечето държави се опитват да отлагат до безкрай, да отлагат до безкрай. В същото време парите се харчат за съвсем други цели. Благодаря. Имате още въпроси, може да напишете. If you have more questions, you can write them down in the Q&A chat. Може би аз имам още един въпрос и то е... Perhaps I have one more question. And this is... We, as people who have worked a lot on the trial in the transport area, we probably have an idea where we should focus our funds. And as Xavier said, we need to invest in urban mobility. The question is who makes the decision and how do you see a putting a priority on в Европа и обрагвам аз лично мучето, че някак си се губи по трасето връзката между истинските нужди на хората от едни страна от хора предпочитаме да отворя да отворя в нашата част на Европа. Как виждате пресечането на тези връзки? Crossing those lines, Daniel is willing to answer. I will give a very easy example with the recovery of resilience plan, which said out 100 electric buses, of course, replacing old diesel buses is one positive change, but my proposal was to pilot regions, regardless of its level, whether it's a municipality or region, where all old buses are replaced by these new electric buses, which would have had стойност като инвестиция, защото много лесно щяхме да устойностим замърсяването, което спестяваме. Много бързо щеше да бъде виган ефект от хората и за чистия и удобния нов транспорт. И страшно много пари щяха да спестят самите институции, защото всъщност поддържането, поддържането на тези автобуси е кошмарно скъпо. Така че ето примера как And this is an example of how we left the buses. We will buy these buses, but they will be spread all over Bulgaria and the effect will be insignificant, if we can say so. Thank you, Daniel. Xavier? Add something on where decisions are taken. So, Desi, I think your point about citizens organizing um, is a very important one. I think over the last years, there's been a lot of mobilization around climate issues, especially for the youth. But whenever we discuss transport, it's it's harder to 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 get messages through and for people to really mobilize. Um, we are in 
developing uh, together with local activists the so-called clean cities campaign and i would share share a link and that's a tentative you know to to rally around um, transformation of urban mobility in several cities across europe and i think it's it's a good way it's, you know beyond the kind of work that we do in brussels trying to think about the regulations you know the policy landscape to also try to have these these actions at local local level because that's certainly also where the change will come if at the end of the day let's say from the eu institutions we manage to design better investment tools for mobility at some point still a lot of the decisions will have to be taken one way or another at local level so i think it's extremely important to to keep trying to mobilize citizens um, that can have very diverging views on you know parking their cars and what kind of, kind of mobility they want to have but to have that dialogue and, and discussions at local level thank you and i just wanted to add that Zamiat is also part of this network for green cities um and we had also a colleague here and we have different activities so we could invite uh, the attendees of the webinar from bulgaria to follow us and what we try to do is particularly in Sofia for the moment. Lorela, do you have some... Well, questions? I can say, yeah, maybe a last word, but I... Um, indeed, like, changing mobility patterns is a challenge, but we see this happening in some places, like in big cities, for example, more and more people are switching to bike or scooters or whatever. So I think a good question to ask ourselves and to ask publicly when we have exchanges with people is to say, like, who needs a car? So really speaking about people's needs, and that's uh, that's really important. And then we can realize that actually, yeah, not um, the, it's not the same solution for everyone. So it's very contextualized. And one thing that we did recently with Greenpeace is campaigning for a climate ticket or a ticket that is affordable for public transport. We saw last year in Germany that the nine euro ticket was really a popular measure, um, especially because of the cost of living crisis. So now we are, yeah, we're talking a lot and we're offering solutions like recommendations of policies and so on to make transport affordable as uh, in, in addition to being accessible because we know that people are very concerned now about the cost about the wallet which is normal because yeah the situation is is serious so yeah we also need sometimes to yeah um um yeah, choose the arguments and the framing we want to to use to to speak with people and really listen what they need as well, so we can offer solutions or raise awareness about the cost of owning a car. These kind of things, like all the aspects of mobility, which are really important for people. Like when they think of their mobilities, they don't think about the climate or the environment first, but they think about yeah, I need to go there, <laughs> my freedom. Yeah my wallet and so on so that, that's really really important okay thank you um thank you very much i really would like to thank uh you all the speakers uh, for joining in um there was one additional question to daniel um are we building a railway transport towards serbia or is on the serbian side if you know very quickly Yes, as I already mentioned, the, the, mention, the project is being implemented. The question is right now, Serbia has put a priority on their railway corridor that goes through North Macedonia to Thessalonica. As for the link to Bulgaria that uh, is, uh, has been long deteriorating, they prefer Bulgaria to pay toll fees uh, on their motorways for both freight and passengers. Uh, thank you to all panelists. We had almost 40 participants in many countries in Europe. There were many Bulgarians. I know you cannot see the rest, but there were many. It was a pleasure for me and it was very interesting 
moderator, yarmasını sınavlar aldı. I hope for more cooperation with my colleagues from Brussels. And see you soon. I wish good night to everyone. Bye everyone and thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Good evening, everyone. Good evening.